Okay, and we're off. And I'd like to give a very warm welcome to Dana Small. How are you, Dana? I'm good. How are you, Johnny? Very good. Thanks very much. Really appreciate you joining me. Super early o'clock in California. Um, yeah. And it sounds like we've actually got better weather in the UK than you've got in uh, California at the moment. Is that really true? Yeah, <laughs> past couple of days have definitely been overcast, um, but it's much appreciated when it gets to be 100 degrees here in the summer. So I'll take the little bit of cool off we get. We don't really have that problem over here. But um, <laughs> so um, so where you are, you're you're kind of about what, about 30 miles away from San Francisco, something like that? Yeah, about 20, 30. Yeah, it's not too far. So there's some really amazing places near you. Like how long does it take to get to places like Yosemite? Is that like a couple of hours? Yeah, I haven't been to Yosemite. That definitely takes um, a couple of hours. And it's interesting. You can drive, you know, to LA, you could drive to San Diego, but they are a little bit of a haul. It's about a good eight hour drive, I think, to San Diego. But there is a ton of stuff. You can hit Tahoe in just a few hours. Um, you can hit, go up north and see Oregon. You can see so many things um, really within just a couple of hours or a quick flight, right? So SFO to wherever Vegas is a nice, quick 45 minute flight. Yeah, I've done a little bit of traveling around that area and I was just stunned how you can be in like a massive city in the morning and then in just complete wilderness in the afternoon. <laughs> Pretty yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah, I'd say I'm close to out in the wilderness and I am only about 25 miles away. So go figure. Excellent stuff. Well, listen, we've got some, some topics that we're looking to discuss today around services procurement and kind of looking at strategy versus tactics. Um but before we get into that, would you be able to give a little bit of background on, on what you do now and what your kind of journey through the industry has been? Yeah, sure. So I'll start at the beginning. Um, I have a, actually a biology undergrad um, and I worked in the lab for a few years and found out that was not the place for me. Um, quality control can be very mundane and repetitive. Um, so if you're looking for one of those jobs, you want to follow an SOP every day, that's, that's the job for you, but it wasn't for me. And so I ended up going back and getting my MBA, um, an executive MBA like full time while I still was working full time. And at that point I started networking, um, and I ended up moving into a finance role into financial planning analysis. Um, and I've always been in, because of the biology background, right, in, in pharmaceuticals. So I started my career at Eli Lilly. I've been to Amgen, Gilead, now at Biomarin. Um, so I've got a pretty long, sadly enough, history in the pharma space. But once I moved from finance, I actually moved out to Amgen from Lilly. And I did it for a couple of years, but I, was, I moved over to the sales and marketing team pretty quickly. Um, to support them and spent the majority of my time there. And after being an FP&A for a while, you can see how great you can affect things on the back end with accruals and reporting and, you know, earnings per share and move pushing and pulling expenses um, from that side. But I really wanted to learn how to influence from the front end, right? Like, it's great that you can kind of report out from finance on the back end, but it's kind of after everything's done and you're just fixing things. And so I moved into the sourcing organization, um, still supporting sales and marketing because I, I still loved my business partners that I had at Amgen. Um, but interestingly enough, I did some sales and marketing, but I also did consulting was my main category. So that was, I don't know, at the time, I think it was like $67 million worth of spend. It was a good ch chunk of change for management consulting specifically. Um, but from there, I've kind of expanded out. You know, I took the move. I went over to um, Gilead and really focused on agencies and, you know, that kind of focus within commercial. Um, was there for a couple of years and then the opportunity came up at BioMarin and I've been here now uh, almost five years. Um, so I've been doing sourcing, gosh, this is makes me feel old, but I've done it for at least about 10 years, pharmaceuticals 20, finance about 15. So I've got a really interesting kind of well-rounded background moving from finance right into uh, strategic sourcing. But right now what I'm doing, I have all of commercial and I also have um, a por good portion of professional services, which includes consulting um, and other service categories. And basically it's a it's a global role and it's 
Um, we're a small team. <laughs> we're a team of two, um, but we get things done and we have to do things in a manner that's really efficient, really effective, and really good for Biomarin because we're growing, right? We're um, a smaller company, but yet, you know, we're projecting to be 5 billion more in spend, I think, in, you know, five years was the goal. Um, we're, we're expecting to expand, but at the same time, we do have initiatives that say, let's stay kind of lean and mean and be efficient um, and not just go on like a hiring spree and not, you know, do anything too crazy so that we're really, we're doing an initiative that's called fit for growth. And I think the sourcing function really is there to help aid people in being fit for growth and getting every penny out of that lifestyle or in getting the right agreements in place and making sure we have the right long-term partnerships in place so that when we do kind of grow up and become a little bit of a bigger mid-sized biotech, um, that we have everything in place, right? As far as structure goes and um, sourcing and contracts. Really interesting. So, so I guess looking at your background, funnily enough, I um, studied biology at university as well and, and nice. fairly quickly decided that that wasn't <laughs> really for me. Um, do you think, I mean, what, what would, obviously being, coming from a scientific background, I'm assuming you, you're just naturally quite analytical. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, I mean, I'm sure, obviously, if you had a biology undergrad, you had to do you know, research papers, and there's very much a method, right? Not a method to the madness, but it's very clear and calculated, like coming up with a hypothesis, coming up, um, looking through the data, doing the analysis afterwards, seeing, testing whether or not your theory is correct or incorrect. And so I do think I've always been kind of science and numbers focused. Um, so I do think that does help um, in kind of the sourcing to background to, to be able to really analyze the data and figure out hey, where do we need the most help or support and looking at external market data, internal market data, right? The whole picture of the ecosystem of what's really going on. Well, I guess it kind of ties into to our overarching topic today of, of strategic versus tactical mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, you're talking about your own company, you know, you're a small team, you've got to be super efficient. You're going to have to use automation. You're going to have to use smart technology where you can, because otherwise you're just going to spend your whole time being transactional and, and engage in tactical activities. Whereas obviously if you've got analytical, all this analytical capability, then that's massively useful to be able to deliver that to the business. And that's, for me, that's one of the key areas where the, the power lies with procurement in an organization. I mean, just the amount of data yes. you have coming up, running past you. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't think a lot of business partners realize we have access and visibility into everything globally, right? So when I was in FP&A and I supported commercial, I could see like headcount expenses. I could see everything on the P&L for commercial for the business units I supported. But when you're in strategic sourcing, you have access to the entire company, the entire amount of spend. Um, you may not have as much detail around that spend as far as like headcount and things of that sort, but it really does allow you to have access to data to be able to make the right strategic decisions, right? So if you're taking a look and saying, hey, we're spending 50 million on agencies globally, but 45 of that's US, fives, you know, EU, and you start breaking things down, it really helps you to come up with the best long-term strategy and long-term partnership um, by having that data. Uh, and I think it's really key to our jobs to be able to be strategic in a sense, right? Without that, how can you make the right decisions? Yeah, I totally agree. And also without that, then procurement as a function are undervalued by, by the rest of the business mm -hmm. in the C-suite. Because if procurement are just seen as transactional or tactical, then you know, there's not that willingness to, to bring, in, bring in that um, the, the kind of passage of information through to the C-suite so much. Whereas if it is truly strategic, you've got some seriously valuable information at your fingertips. Yeah. And, and I think the other thing that I always find really interesting about this from a kind of, you know, bit overall business strategy point of view is you can see what's going on inside the business. You can see what's going on outside the business when you're analyzing the market, looking at supply yeah. chains and suppliers, but also you're getting feedback from suppliers as well, which I think is really interesting, particularly when you're dealing with professional services and consulting and things like that, where, you know, these companies are taking a real, kind of confidential inside look at, at businesses and and their feedback in theory could be extremely useful. 
Yeah. So it's interesting. I always see myself as not only to support the business partner internally, but also externally, right? So having the ability to get feedback from multiple clients globally, I can then consolidate and be that one point person to say to the consulting firm or, you know, whoever it is, Hey, I'm hearing, you know, across organization, different things. Let's sit down and have a conversation about it. This is the feedback we have so that we can grow the partnership. We can make things work. Um, but it really is a two way street. So if we can give that information, but a lot of times we don't get it back in return and sometimes we get it in droves. So it really depends on the supplier and how much they want to share. Um, and then how much sharing we can do in return to be able to really help that relationship kind of grow. But we are, to me, in my opinion, that point person that is that kind of third party intermediary um, between the business and, you know, the suppliers. And it's an interesting place to be because you, you have to almost go to bat for the suppliers sometimes um, internally when you're like, listen, we can't cut costs anymore. We can't have them, you know, this isn't a nonprofit. And same thing with the business partners. I, at the end of the day, I have to do what's right for my business and making sure we're getting quality costs, right? All at a good level. Um, but it's really kind of these conflicting things that you really have to balance um, and getting be- feedback from both sides, right? Sometimes it feels a lot like counseling sessions when we have quarterly business reviews. And, and, and when you look at things like those quarterly business reviews, um, how, um, how reliant is that on the ability to collect data? Because if you're having a, a QBR, you know, in a lot of cases, it can sometimes be kind of, um, it can sometimes be lip service in some companies, yes. some organizations, because there's just not enough information. It's like, we said we do a QBR, We'll do it. Everyone okay? Yes, we're all okay. You know, it's kind of, there's not that much weight to it. But I guess when you've got real data, you can actually, you can see what's happening in flight and make some real inferences. Yeah. So when you can get, you know, whether it's a technology involved or something as simple as Survey Monkey, you can get a lot of really good data. The problem is, once again, people hate surveys and people hate giving you data or feedback. So if you can get the information, it is extremely valuable. If you can almost force a function and just say, I have a five minute questionnaire, just finish this and we'll be able to have a better conversation with the supplier at the end of the day. Because to your point earlier, a lot of times it's lip service. It's this fluffy, this is what we did, and this is how great we were, and we saved you this money. There's none of the true kind of meat or data to it saying, all right, great, but we think you guys are lacking in this area, and you think we're lacking in this area, right? And then we can share that and figure out what's the next best step so that we can resolve these issues so that you know maybe we have accounting problems and you need help with that as a supplier or internally, maybe we're having issues getting things in a timely manner. Either way, having that data and having you know people, whether they fill out a survey or whatever it is, having the ability to have that information can make a huge difference to just getting things out in the open and getting them resolved pretty quickly. It's, it's, it's really interesting. You think, gosh, this is so simple. They're telling me X and they're telling me Y. Why aren't they just doing you know, what it needs? But a lot of times it's just sometimes they don't want to have that communication breakdown. They want to keep that relationship. And so I think strategic sourcing can play a great role in having that third party uh, intermediary relationship to kind of work things out for both people exactly and and you know just ask the awkward questions on both Mm -hmm. sides um and actually you know make data driven um inferences and comments based on what's actually happening um i mean i think personally i believe that in, in services procurement because it is much more difficult to measure um there is an inherent problem with people knowing what's going on, knowing what their spend relates to and, and understanding value against that, which is the kind of the ultimate um, panacea. Um, but when you look at bigger suppliers and bigger projects, obviously that's easier. Um, it's kind of small, smaller number of big things. But when you look at tail spend, when you look at that long tail of smaller suppliers, which may be where there's huge value, but is also generally where there's even less data and it's just far, far more mm-hmm. difficult to manage. Um, that's, that's a pretty difficult area to, to get on top of, really. 
Yeah, tailspin is one of those areas that becomes sort of a bane of your existence. <laughs> um, it's it's like you're always you're a cat and mouse game, right? You catch some up with some, and then all of a sudden suppliers are popping up here. So you're constantly trying to kind of get a hold of them and rein them in. But I will say a lot of the times there is a good business case for the tail spend where you can say, um, at least in pharmaceuticals, hey, they have a very specific skill set around hematology, oncology. We really need an agency or we really need a consulting firm that can help us and who has the background and has seen this disease state before. And so we need them just for this one project. And so there's a business case for that tailspin in some sorts. A lot of the times there isn't, but um, you could argue it both ways of like, there are certain times where it's manageable, but I don't think you could ever get, um, from my perspective, ever kind of really truly get rid of tailspin um, just for those reasons, at least within the pharma industry. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think it would be um, potentially a real negative to actually get rid of tailspin. You know, it's, it's how businesses bring smaller suppliers in that may grow to be much more, much bigger suppliers. I'm sure during the pandemic, there are tailspin suppliers that have grown to be hugely strategic yeah. partners for lots of lots of organizations, particularly in the pharmaceutical and healthcare industry. Yeah, um, it's interesting. You know, you always want to try to consolidate and move in with your big, uh, biggest suppliers so that you can achieve economies of scale, best negotiation leverage, right? But there are times where this pandemic has kind of thrown a wrench in things and, you know, things have started moving in a different direction. So some of our smaller suppliers are areas like virtual meetings where before we kind of did some, but now it's like everything's virtual meetings. And so we've had to RFP things and it, the category has just exploded, right? So some of those smaller suppliers who were doing virtual meetings were on the front end of that really did take a bigger presence um, versus some of the more um, in-person meetings, right? So that that whole area has shifted. But I agree that you know, some of the smaller suppliers and areas where I think, you know, maybe we we're just delving into now have just exploded. And now, you know, we're trying to learn and grow with them. And, you know, especially with the small diverse suppliers, right? It's very important for us to try to bring those in and um, make sure we're fair. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, it's, it's fair, but it's also, uh, it also makes good business sense to mm -hmm. work with suppliers that are delivering you value. And some of these small suppliers, small really niche suppliers might be absolutely critical when they're needed, but they don't really have much visibility because it's just it's just very difficult. If, if people are running a manual process for tail spend, yeah. you know, it's almost impossible to stay on top of it. I mean, from our point of view, you know, we're very focused on on tail spend around with the automation side of things of, of what we do around managing services, procurement through technology. Um, and if you could automate that area. You're cutting out things like rogue spend. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're reducing the kind of misclassification risk of kind of body shopping and, and effectively headcount being hidden within that service <laughs> supply chain, which is you know, something that, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think something that can be easy, easily overlooked is that if you can actually bring that tail spend into a, into a system and actually get visibility of it, the beauty of that visibility is being able to see what you've got access to. Because there's probably some really, really good suppliers in there that, as you say, may be mm -hmm. able to grow. They may be extremely diverse and, and, and fit in really well with the ethics and the purpose of your wider organization, which is something that I think is becoming more and more important. Yeah, I think, you know, they say with the millennials um, and even Gen Z that they really want to work for companies that um, do good, right, and are sustainable and care about you know, other people and diversity and really including people. And I think with that generational shift, um, it's not just about consolidating, find us the biggest supplier, let's do what we can do. It's, hey, let's find new innovative techniques and ideas. And one of the ways we can do it is by leveraging small diverse suppliers, right? And I think it's a good shift to have with the younger workforce coming in that we can really leverage these these smaller businesses who may have something amazing we just don't know yet right um, I love personally to be on the front end of technology and so I've implemented some small solutions like early on probably five years ago 
um, Teal Book was one of them. And now it's amazing to see what that company has really turned into where it was just so tiny and there's like three people or four people working there. And now it's, you know, 20 or 30 staff and it, it's grown. Um, if you can see, I think the vision with some of these smaller suppliers, you can really use that to your advantage. And I think the great part about that is when you do use these smaller suppliers, you're able to give your input. So part of that process is they're like, okay, you're one of our first customers. Give us feedback, give, give us information. What would you do? How would you do it? I helped them and provided the mock-ups. Listen, I would sketch this this way and I would do this that way. You really can influence those suppliers and their product and what they're doing to help support your business, right? To help support that innovation. So it's tailored to your needs. And I think a lot of people when they think of sourcing and they don't always think innovation because it's always, you know, at the top of the pyramid and the last thing to think about. But if you can do that from the bottom up, you have much more of an impact and you can really shape how they support your business and how they innovate and do great things for, you know, other businesses too. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And it kind of leads on to, to one of the other points that uh, I wanted to, to bring up for discussion, which was around problem solving with suppliers. Um, in the sense that effectively when you're talking about innovation there, for example, you know, it's there's this value, but there's there's potentially more to be had than what you're what you're getting. If you can be open to working with these suppliers, whether it's a business manager with a requirement that's saying, you know what, you're the specialist in hematology. Can you help me shape this requirement going out to three or four different suppliers, getting different bids, all who might be approaching it in a different way, but might bring that kind of overall statement of work or, or work order together. Um, in a really meaningful way. Um, but it's also this concept of innovation, which if you're not taking care of these suppliers and you're not really building a relationship with them, that's a lot harder. Yeah, and I also think a lot of the larger companies, because they have the buying power and the leverage, they tend to tell their, <laughs> tell their suppliers what they're going to do and how they're going to do it, which I don't always think is kind of the best method to go about things. Um, and I just forgot where I was going with that. Uh, well, it's, it kind of kills the innovation, doesn't it? Because I, I don't, yeah, that's another... exactly sorry. That's exactly you made my point for it. You're you're just telling people what to do and how to do it, right? So, what innovation are you going to have? How are you going to grow? Is it and is that really a partnership, right? When we say in strategic sourcing, at least I do say we want long term partnerships. We want to be strategic in nature. We want you know, to think things through, how can you allow those people to innovate and grow if you're, you know, whoever it is spending 2 billion telling them, Hey, here's your margin. Here's this. You're going to, we're going to pay you like three, three months later, we're going to do this. You're going to do that. I mean, that really can stifle a relationship, right? How creative and how much of a partnership can you really have when it's a one-way street effectively? Yeah. And you just imagine those QBRs where it's like, the supplier being hammered and hammered and hammered and hammered and then it's like right what are your three in innovation points let's get creative and then they're like being crushed to the floor it doesn't really work yeah. Does it? yeah no it doesn't at all and you're not really motivating people to want to innovate to help support your system you're just doing it to to get you know the best margin or leverage and to me that's not a good business decision if you think about it yes you're being able to maintain margins but at what cost, right? And it, if the cost is innovation to something that could potentially, you know, launch you into a new market or could expedite, you know, the production process, then you're really doing yourself a disservice by crushing these suppliers and not allowing them to innovate and not allowing them to feel like they're part of the process and have a say so in what they're doing. Yeah, I, I think um, just to touch on another thing that you said earlier, just in terms of talking about alignment of values with your supply chain, do you ever see instances where the supply chain is actually kind of pushing that back onto companies where supply chain, suppliers are actually saying, well, do you know what? I know we're, we're, the, we're being paid here, but actually we want to work with, with clients that echo our values. Do you think that's something that we like to see more in the, in the marketplace? Because they're clearly going to be serving the the needs of, you know, their, their own overall business philosophy and also the people that work for them as well. Yeah, I think a lot of the times uh, businesses, at least in the pharma industry, who support or who use that vertical typically have the same mindset and want to 
help grow and support pe- other people and patients in their lives, right? So I don't see it as much from the supply side pushing us. I really see it from us pushing onto them like, hey, this is our patient need and our patient population. This is what we have to do. But again, most of the time they're already coming to the table knowing when they're supporting you know, pharmaceutical, they're making a drug that could save somebody's life. And so it's a little bit different than making a widget or making, uh, you know, whatever it is, an airplane. So I think there's a different mindset with those suppliers approaching us. Do they push kind of what we have on us? Not really. I, I see, at least from my side, I see it more of us pushing onto them. Like we have to, this is our imperative. This is our business driver and either get on board or, you know, we're going to keep charging ahead. Um, but I do think it would be interesting to see the supply side, at least in pharma, if they were able to push, like, this is our mantra, this is what we're doing. Can you support it and see where that go? I think it'd be a hard sell in pharma, but I think in other industries, it definitely could work, right? Where it's like, hey, we want to be eco-sustainable. We're happy to do business with you, Nike, but we want you to use green products or we want you to do this. And it is a partnership, right? So as much as us as a business who's paying the supplier can say, hey, we want to be eco-friendly. Here are our goals. So should our suppliers back to us say, we have goals too. Let's work together as a partnership so we both can achieve them. Right. It's a lot easier if you guys are working together than it is working against each other. Yeah. And I guess that echoes with things like um, diversity and inclusion in the sense that, you know, within your organization, to a certain extent, you can control where the priorities are and make make diversity and inclusion a priority. But also understanding where that sits within your supply base and having visibility of that, as you say, within that kind of um, long tail of smaller suppliers there may be some really diverse suppliers mm-hmm. in there um, that, that, you know, I, I always think of diversity with the kind of, there's the fairness aspect of it. And then there's the, there's just the pure value of having yeah. different people from different backgrounds and different organizational structures mm-hmm. and different experiences to add to the overall um, effort of what you're trying to achieve. Um, but it's quite hard to actually report on that unless you can clearly see your supply chain. I mean, do, uh, lots of organizations will have criteria around, for example, mm-hmm. diversity in their supply chain. Um, I think, you know, in the US, you're doing a lot better job of this than in Europe, for example, in terms of like um, women-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, mm-hmm. etc. diverse businesses. I think they get um, more attention and more waiting, but I think Europe's trying to catch up with that, but you've still got to be able to see them and report on them. Yeah, it's really driven, I have to say, by the government um, and then requiring the companies that work with them or sell it to them that say, hey, you need to have a goal for diversity. We're, in a sense, forcing you. You have to not only report out to us in a year, but you have to give us your plan for the upcoming year to tell us what you're going to do to try to write the fairness aspect, include diverse suppliers. Maybe it's in RFPs, whatever it is, but also to kind of grow and expand these businesses Because to your point, with different backgrounds, different um, upbringings and different places where you've lived, you're going to have different ideas than the same, you know, five guys who went to college who are on the board of directors, right? You're just going to have a different viewpoint from your upbringing, from the life you lived. And I think there's an inherent value to that that a lot of people don't see. Um, And I think that's why the government pushes the reporting and for you to come up with this plan. Um, I know, I think the banking industry also, financial industry also has some government requirements um, akin to that, but I think we're better at it because we're forced to be, Um, not necessarily because we're proactive about it, but we have to be, right? And I think it's a good thing. I think it's, you know, stemmed from a long line back in the 60s and when originally the government was trying to make, you know, equal opportunity and all those great things for women owned and small businesses and diverse businesses. But I think it's that push um, from our own government and the reporting to make it fair that pushes us as companies to really have that transparency, right? And even into secondary suppliers. So say maybe um, you're talking about headcount or FTE support consulting, who are they, who maybe for um, outside FTE, who are we contracting with? Where is that second tier 
And are those people diverse? Because we can report out on that and claim that too, as like, hey, these are diverse suppliers that are be high, being hired, right? They're second into the supply chain, but it's second tier. And we still can um, use those people in that sense, even though we have maybe a consolidating uh, agency or umbrella company that um, gets them all together for us to use. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you're still getting the benefit of that kind mm -hmm. of cognitive diversity. And by virtue of you working with the tier one suppliers, you're helping them, you're helping their supply chain, you're yeah. supporting diverse business generally. Um, but I think in terms of, again, coming back to the reporting aspect mm -hmm. of it, particularly within the tail spend, a lot of stuff can fly under the radar, you know, where, where you know, somebody, uh, a buying manager might have quite tight restrictions on headcount, but they might have quite a big capacity for consulting spend, for example, professional services spend that might just almost happen kind of directly. Um, and I think there are, there are huge potentials for, for savings to be made in that area in terms of ensuring like you get a competitive process, making sure mm -hmm. the procurement can actually put it through a proper process. Um, but then there's, the, the, there's the, the, the potential missed opportunity of diverse or highly specialist suppliers that might be sitting within the supply chain of some organizations already where they're just not able to be aware of them at the moment. Um, and again, it's that it's, it's kind of fairness in enabling suppliers of all different types, but it's also giving everyone a kind of, you know, uh, a, fair, a fair go at it by, right. um, by making them visible within the organization, which is again, where I think that automation and visibility comes in. Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting area when you think about tailspin and the impact and hiding headcount. I think no matter where I've been, it's you're right. It it just happens. It just so happens that you know they have the budget, but they don't have the headcount. And a lot of organizations almost force people to do it. It's we we're only allowed a certain amount of headcount, but we'll give you two million dollars what do you think they're going to do if they're short staffed? I mean, you're kind of creating the problem in itself, right? It, it's fine. And it's fair that you can have this temporary workforce. Um, but at the same time, then you got to manage them, right? Then you've got a sourcing person making sure you're getting fair rates. And if you are using consultants or management consultants, you're not paying a thousand dollars an hour for a partner or principal. And, you know, you're kind of keeping things under wrap. And that you're able to do so in a strategic manner. So, hey, if this is going to be long term, um, you know, are, are we doing it effectively and with the right partners um, to have, you know, the head count in the right place? Yeah. And there's other things that can come into play around that from a, a regulatory point of view. So in the UK at the moment, the, the kind of equivalent of 1099 versus W2 is yeah. just something where the, the law has changed in the UK. Um, it's a, a regulation called IR35, and it's basically where um, it, it's the difference between someone being employed or self-employed. Right. Um, and so within the contingent workforce, there's clearly a major problem to be solved there for companies where they've got contractors that have been working for them for like 10 years. They've got a badge. They're using a company mm -hmm. computer. You know, they're all over the company Facebook page at the office party <laughs> with, a, with a drink in a hand. They, they have the office, the corner office and take vacation at the same time you do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and they've got a team of 50, you know. Um, so so that's that's clearly a problem. But then when you actually um, when you actually start looking into, for example, the extended supply chain on the services side, that can also be a problem because where people are getting around headcount restrictions, you know, as you say, sometimes the company policies and the way that it's structured in terms of spend uh, allowance to sign off, it does sometimes push people down that route. Well, then guess what? You know, that, that they're still going to potentially just be hiring people or working through staffing agencies, but it's going to be wrapped up as, you know, services delivered maybe under a statement of work or just services procurement. So um, that's certainly been a major factor in the UK recently where companies are having to address that and, and be clear on that. Yeah, can go for you, it. Yeah, can you give me one Sorry, we're having the first camp day, uh, I think jitters. It's okay, I texted Amelia's mom, okay? You wanna give me, you wanna hug real quick? I'll give you a hug, come here. <laughs> is, that, is, that is that camping in the garden or something? 
the camp it's so it's she's only five and so it's the first year for like summer camp and so oh, right. um but i don't think it was what we all thought it was gonna be it's okay honey uh, just because i don't think like it was ballet camp so it was supposed to be dance camp but they're not doing a lot of dancing <laughs> so i'm not like why are you making kites why are you yeah. boring <laughs> what, what 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 is going on it's more of a camp and Maybe they're a little bit too young, so I don't know. Um, but I think even her friends having issues with it. Her mom said so. Maybe it's just just the age, or maybe it's just the camp. So, yeah, well, apologies. When you're, when you're apologies. five, it's a big deal. It's a big deal when you're five. It's gonna be okay. So Amelia's mommy will come. If not, I'll take you myself. Okay. 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 I'll work tough. Sorry. Hopefully. No, we can no worries at all. Um, get through that. So. Um, so yeah, just trying to loop back into where we were with, yeah, just looking at that kind of, I guess it's really a co-employment issue. Yes. I mean, it's not, it's not, I mean, California. We you have guys it too. Have, yeah. yeah, we have it too, right? You're only allowed to be, I think, a contractor for two years. Um, otherwise it has that co-employment issue. Um, so you really have to be careful about if you bring the contractor on, how long you can bring them on for, especially if they are, filling in like backfilling maybe it's maternity leave or somebody left for a role so they're just doing it in the interim till you can find somebody and then all of a sudden you love them you want to turn them into a head count but a lot of times you just can't because the way the company is structured things and a lot of times I think it makes sense because that contingent workforce you want to be able to kind of hire and fire um, as your business fluctuates, right? So if demand surges, you want to upscale. If it, it goes down, you really want, you got to get rid of people quickly. And it's much easier to do with a contingent workforce than it is with, you know, headcount. And so I understand why companies make that decision, but in turn, it always ends up driving them to then spend a lot of their money or a lot of their outside expenses with you know staffing firms and um, other people who sometimes you don't know what you're going to get and who end up being in that tailspin, right? It drive it drives that. So it's almost like you're a chicken with your head cut off, running around trying to get, trying to rein it in. It's because of what you've created, right, from the top down and and the rules and how you want to do things. Yeah, and and thing is, it's about using the the kind of resource. Um, channel effectively so permanent headcount it's an effective resource channel for, for the mm -hmm. right things but as you say for scaling up scaling down short-term projects that sort of short-term uh, requirements contingent workforce can be extremely effective yeah. but also so can outsourcing the work uh, on an outcome basis the thing that that i find um interesting is where you see a lot of frustration in the market where particularly for procure from procurement's point of view contingent workforce it's hard to see the value that's coming out of it because if yeah. you've just got uh, you know as they say bums on seats where people are just working on the on the kind of as i always say on the never never they're just there they're working they're mm -hmm. putting you know what's the objective where are the where are the milestones what's going to actually happen now if it's done in the right way of course it's it's the ideal resource for the right type of work but you know there's also a very pragmatic way of getting things done where you are using a statement of work where you are putting deliverables in place but I guess the business has got to be organized enough first for buying managers to be able to really specify what they need to deliver and to tie that into overall objectives, which, which some companies maybe aren't very good at. Yeah, I think the services category, it's not just, you know, some companies, I think most categories or most companies struggle with services and finding their value, especially when it comes to consultants and temps. And a lot of times it's because they need to do things quickly, they will say, we just need to get somebody, like you said, a bum in the seat. So let's do it. So the statement of work is literally Joe Schmo, who's going to be here for the next year project management support. And that's all you have. And as a procurement person, you're like, okay, but what, what are they doing? You know, what are the milestones? What are we going to see? You know, what does good look like with this person, right? At the end of the one-year contract or two-year contract, what's good and what's bad and how do we detect it? It's almost like, you're having to do HR um, as a company to these other people to make sure that you're getting the value out of them. But if you don't set it up in the beginning, 
you're never going to see that. And for procurement, you're really um, going to struggle with it because I think it's just one of those areas that it's really hard to kind of get under grasp and that everybody has a little bit of a different opinion on and it can tend to be emotional, right? Because it's people you're buying in a sense, selling people's time and people and who they are. And so people get very attached to their teams or people get very attached to contractors. And so, you know, being able to do that, companies being able to do that, I think clear and effectively, I think most of them struggle with. I don't, I don't know that anybody's got the greatest handle on it. I'm sure there's some better than others, but I definitely think it's an area most companies struggle with. But if, at least if you have a big enough sourcing team to help, um, you can at least try to get that statement of work from, hey, it's Joe, he's going to be here you know, for six months of, hey, Joe has to produce you know, whatever milestones we expect him to have, you know, three projects finished by end of Q3 and, you know, things of that sort that are a little bit more uh, tactical and granular in nature, but at least you can track and manage and understand what that person resource is doing and it, are they clearly effective or not? And do we need to continue with having them in that role? Yeah. And, and, and particularly when you get into the kind of co-employment side of it, you know, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's, a, it's about a supplier delivering a service. Um, and, and so, you know, it, certainly with regards to the UK legislation, you know, they have, there has to be right of substitution where it doesn't matter whether it's um, Johnny or Susie or Dave doing the work, the work has to be done and it's been specified and it's been laid out. So if companies can get that first bit right and they can capture the information, um, if you can capture on a granular level, which is, you know, for us, it's our, our mission in life is to basically capture the value of services procurement. And if you're, you know, the, the kind of top level procurement systems are very, very good at what they do, but they're not really designed to capture that granular level where you're dealing with milestones. And actually, when you go into the delivery phase and you're saying what's actually been done, mm. but, you know, all of the data that the procurement can have around services, if you're capturing that granular information, you know what, even at a simple level, you know what was agreed to be done. Was it done on time to budget? How much scope creep was there? And then you've got the qualitative um, aspect of did they did they deliver satisfaction to the to the business stakeholder? Um, how was their communication? Did they did they meet our um, you know sustainability supplier standards or whatever it might be? If you can if you can capture that information, then suddenly you've got data that does pertain to value and it does pertain to comparative analysis between suppliers in the services world whereas otherwise it's very difficult because in the on around goods and materials it's quite easy to say there's these you know 200 red widgets i've got a catalog here i've got different vendors they've got you know it might be even amazon for example it's pretty mm -hmm. easy to compare you compare price but one of the things that <clears throat> i'd be interested to get your take on is when you look at the consulting and professional services world you know a lot of people are just working from rate cards Mm -hmm. But that's not really the whole picture, is it? Because your rate card could be cheaper for consultancy A versus consultancy B, but they take three times as long or they do a bad job. It's, it's quite complex. Yeah. And, and to your point about data, the devil's always in the details. A lot of times the suppliers don't want to provide that level of data to you or that level of detail or partner with you because that's how they make their margins. So you find, especially when it comes to consulting um, or anytime you have people who are highly paid, that a lot of times you could get a million dollar scope of work and it'll be like, oh, consulting for X project. And you're like, but it's a million dollars. What are you guys doing? And them not providing that level of granularity and that level of data, it hampers you as sourcing because then how do you go back and negotiate and say, no, you know, this, this isn't right. We can do it by trying to implement a time card. But to your point, it's like a balloon. You squeeze it. Hey, guess what? Rates just dropped in half. Well, guess what? No, my hours just tripled. So they're going to make it up for it someplace. And I think them not wanting to provide that level of detail, I think is inherent just maybe in that industry for consulting uh, that they know that's where the power is, right? The power is in with the data. And if you have the data, if you have the information, if you have the market research, it's easier for you to go and approach them and negotiate the, with them effectively if you don't have that information, if you don't know what resources they have on that million dollar project, how could you ever go back and say, I think it should be half a million? 
how can you say the staffing plan is too heavily weighted um, towards partner hours or towards analyst hours? You can't. And so sourcing really benefits from having that level of clarity and data. And I think suppliers who are smart enough and consultants always are, <laughs> no, that's the game, right? The game is um, whoever has the data, whoever, whoever has the information has the knowledge and is able to really um, even out that relationship. And without that data, you have no buying power. You really don't have a foot to stand on when it comes to sitting at the negotiating table. So I think from a sourcing perspective, data is so important for that reason. And that's why upfront getting that information uh, is necessary and making sure the business understands why, like, yes, I understand we need to do this quickly, but this is gonna help us in the long run. Having this information and this data is gonna help us understand, you know, maybe consulting firm A is cheaper via their rate card, but they're constantly every, you know, scope of work, scope creep. Everyone ends up doubling in size. Every, you know, they're under scoping things. So it may look great from the get go and procurement may be like, yes, we did a great job negotiating. But at the end of the day, if every single scope ends up doubling or has scope creep, then you're really doing yourself a disservice because then, you know, you're having a harder time managing on that end versus um, on the front end and getting those uh, that information. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, if it's a, if it's a million dollar project, it could turn out to be a $2 million project, mm -hmm. but it, but if you capturing even the basics of it's a, it's a, it's a strategy review, there's going to be a report delivered and it's to, it's to make X happen or to work towards X within our strategy. Even if that information is recaptured effectively, then it can be measured against. It just has to be quantified in some way that allows you to see, is the project on track? Is it off track? If it goes over scope, mm -hmm maybe that's actually the company's fault or maybe right. it's actually nobody's exactly. fault. Mm -hmm. but, but for example, you know, the way that we work with customers to capture things like change requests, you know, that makes a huge difference because, you know, a lot of the time um, a project will be, a statement of work will be created. You know, generally companies are pretty good at having some sort of contract in place. It might not be standardized. And in the, in the tail spend, you know, it starts getting a bit tenuous. Mm -hmm. But then what happens to that? It's a, it's a statement of work they get stuck in a shared drive somewhere and it may or may not have milestones associated with it, which may or may not have changed during the duration of the project. They may or may not have been measured against, but when it comes to it, procurement are just left to have to go back and actually retrospectively dig out the contract, read through it, which takes a huge amount of time, try and yeah. unpick all this information. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if you can capture that systematically and you can approve it systematically, even if it's basic, you're getting an idea of what was originally agreed. Did it get done? Yeah. Did they do a good job? If it needs to be more, great. And I think that hopefully suppliers will start to embrace that because I I, I totally know what you're talking about with regards to this kind of veil of secrecy that some particularly consulting suppliers enjoy in the market at the moment. But I feel like COVID's changed that. I feel like COVID has put businesses in that were in a position where they're like, do you know what? Being to budget is not good enough anymore. We need to know what we're getting for this money. But also it plays into the kind of cost versus value conversation, because if a chief financial officer is, is coming to you and saying, you know, you've got to slash spend by 10 percent next year because we're cutting costs, that might be the right thing to do. But if you can show the value of what you're buying, for example, in services procurement, then that CFO might be saying this is driving a five extra return on the bottom line. Mm -hmm. We should be spending more. And I, I think COVID possibly has, has, has really changed some of the attitudes to that. Do you, do you see that being something that could change? You know, I definitely think um, procurement's been around a while, sourcing has been around a while, and COVID has definitely expedited a lot of things that maybe were kind of in the background that we were thinking of playing with that, you know, just we had to do, right? It was a force function. COVID became this huge force function of, um, but I think, in that time and tenure, you know, services, when you're trying to figure out what is the value, that's the hardest part of like the job, right? Where, where a widget, you know what it is, you know what you're buying, you can test quality, you can test these things, they can be within certain limits, but understanding the quality that you're getting for your people, you know, you're right. If you need to, maybe you do need, you're going to 5X return, maybe you do need to increase spending here and not cut 10%. But finding and being able to report out that data to say it's 
giving us X is always the struggle, right? That struggle with services is it's so hard to come up with um, data or whatever it is to explain, this is why this is so important. And this is why we should, it is okay. We went from a million dollar scope to 4 million because we've asked them to do X, Y, and Z. But unfortunately as procurement, we have to, to your point, go back to the contract, go back. Why did, why is this gone from 1 million to 4 million? Like what went wrong here? Right. And a lot of times it is the business partner saying, Oh yeah. Can you also do this? Okay. Well, but there's another change order. Oh yeah, you know what? This is great, but okay, here's another. I've seen, seen things go from 1 million to 4 million in a year. And you're like, what happened here? And it just explodes and there's no control over it too, right? So I think COVID though has forced the function of like what's valuable and how much are we getting out of it? Because if you think about like say office space, it's like how valuable is office space now? Right. And I think a lot of companies are taking a look at, okay, we don't have to be fully remote, but we can be partially remote and get rid of a lot of our costs. So just certain things like that, I think it's definitely made a huge turn on, you know, do we really need this and what is the value we're getting out of it? It really can drive that type of um, thought process. And that, hey, do we really need it, right? We haven't needed it for a year. Do we need it now? And what, if we do, what is the value? And how do you track and measure to make sure you're getting the value that you need out of that contract, out of that, you know, person or service that you're hiring? Yeah, I agree. And I think, you know, you're absolutely right when you talk about measuring value being the hardest thing. And it's the, it's the holy grail, really. Um, mm -hmm. when it comes to, to, to services procurement and understanding what, what's your return on investment. Um, I think there's certain things that are absolutely doable now, and that is being able to comparatively assess suppliers. Because if you do capture information on every project within technology, for example, if you allow that automation to do the kind of bits that should be automated, not take away from what procurement can do. So move move the responsibility yeah. of procurement people from transacting to more strategic, more analytical, then you can look at, on a project by project basis, did what was asked to be done get done? Was it done mm -hmm. on time, on budget, scope creep? What were the quality vectors against that? If you can see that, then you can make a judgment of, of how well a supplier is delivering. And you can look at your supply chain, maybe across categories or in comparative analysis before you procure something in a particular area. That's really, really powerful. I think where it comes down to the responsibility of the individual business and when it comes to these consulting projects, what did they do to the bottom line? That is really difficult to measure. But it, the more that companies can get towards that, the more effective they're going to be because it's forcing business stakeholders and it's forcing it right up the chain for people to say, what's the strategy? Where are we going? What are we looking to do? Mm -hmm. How does that break down? And what are the component parts on a granular level, that, the component things that need to be done to get us to that objective? And, and what does that mean from a financial perspective? And it's like, you know, when you're doing really top level business planning, I'm sure you've come up, you know, against this yourself, where you're, you're planning out far into the future and you're like, this is getting pretty tenuous here. I'm, there's proxies and finger in the air and all that stuff happening. <laughs> yes, yes. But, you know, when you, when, you, when you spend time with the good management consultancies and you see how they do stuff like that, there is always value in it. There is always value in that kind of forward planning. And you have to, you have to use, you know, experience and inferences and the data that you have to try and extrapolate. Um, so it's, it's never going to be an exact science because you're trying to kind of predict the future to a certain extent. If a piece of strategy comes off, what's that going to mean in terms of how that affects the market, et cetera. Um, but I think the more companies are actually looking to actively address that, the, uh, the greater opportunity there is there to realize the value and then focusing on those areas that are really delivering it. Yeah, I think it's interesting. You know, when you think, what do consultants do at the end of the day? You could say their output sometimes for $4 million, I get a PowerPoint slide deck, right? You could say that is the value they're providing. That said, what's in the deck is what you want to measure. Did we implement those things? Did we do those things? Did we actually listen? Or did we pay $4 million to get lip service from a consultant to tell us what we already know and put it on paper? Because a lot of the times that's what I've seen, right? Uh, and if, if they can't help you implement, I think that's, you know, sometimes that's tough. But at the end of the day, just saying, hey, I got this PowerPoint deck, 
you know, that's, that's not enough, um, I think, to really be able to measure and capture the value of what they're doing and what they can bring with a lot of their expertise, right? But I think your point's valid is that, you know, if we can standardize and track and trace to some point of what they were supposed to be doing versus um, what ended up happening, that there is some value you can provide like, hey, the consultant is doing more than just a PowerPoint deck. You can go about and have a good kind of supplier relationship management piece where you can see the value that they're providing, right? It's tough, especially in the services category um, because truly sometimes it is just a PowerPoint deck. But I think if you are able to utilize the technology to be able to manage it effectively, then you can somewhat get your arms around it and at least make sure you're getting the value for what you need from you know your management consultants. Yeah, I mean, even just what they said they deliver. And mm -hmm. I, my theory is that it's gotta be good for them as well because it must be hugely frustrating for consulting firms who get brought in to, to put together a really good bit of strategy work, which, which the output of that could be on the face of it, a PowerPoint slide deck. But behind the scenes has been hours of workshops, teams being brought mm -hmm. in, you know, sitting on steering committees yeah. and all this sort of stuff. But it must be hugely frustrating when the business doesn't execute on that and they, they, they don't implement it. And like you say, you know, sometimes it's a kind of, you know, they'll deliver it and they're off. Sometimes mm -hmm. they'll, they'll try and help implement. But there's certain things that the, the people delivering that consultancy advice can control and there's certain things that they can't. Right. And the responsibility split. Um, so that's where businesses have to do the hard yards around understanding value. And OK, so there was so rather than just saying we spent um, two million with Deloitte, for example, it would be a question of we spent two million with Deloitte to deliver a strategic report around entry into X market. And then the business can say, OK, well, that was what they were, were doing. Did we go into that market? Right. So they recommend they recommended that we did. Did we do it? Actually, we did. And you know what? That's delivered massive value. Um so I think it's just the more information, the better. And I appreciate with these kind of, um, you know, hard to pin down type, mm -hmm. you know, hard to put into quantitative metrics, but you can still capture data. And if you capture data, then that's that can be, you know, analytical people such as yourself can really use that. And I think that's where, that's the future of procurement from my point of view, I believe in, uh, in that real strategic value rather than just tactical value. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think it's part of the evolution from procurement to strategic sourcing, right? Where both in the past we were just buyers and we were very executional to this new thought that we should really be strategic and we should really be the liaison and be partners and what value can we provide. But I do find it very hard to say on the back end, most of us are so busy with the front end and the sourcing and the coming up with strategy, the tracking and measuring at the end sometimes gets lost, right? And there's this great graph that shows, uh, this is what happens to your contract if you measure it, and this is how much it actually gets here to, and this is how much value you lose if you don't track and measure, you know, what happens after, after it gets put in place, because most of the time people just kind of move on to the next thing. And we're, we're constantly, hey, new RFP, new this. If we're not focused on making sure what we did got implement, implemented like a consultant, then where is the value? How do we know what we got out of it? And I think there's so many times where people implement great things, great intentions with the contract. And then at the end of the day, they just, they don't come to fruition and you just don't see the value out of them because either they didn't implement them the right way or they didn't implement it at all. Or to your point, like, Hey, did we go into this market? Well, no, because X, Y, and Z, at least you're able to make an informed decision. Um, so maybe it was good ROI on the project overall, but um, us being able to not just be buyers, to think strategically, you really do need um, as much information data as you can get because analytically minded people can take that and cut it and slice it and dice it five different ways to say, okay, if you look at from this perspective, you know, we could figure out something here. And if you look at it, slice the other way, you know, from an industry perspective, you can do it here. You can do a lot more with just buying something and just, you know, the transactional procurement than um, you could without that data. Yeah, I totally agree. And, and it kind of comes back to what you said at the beginning around it's important what happens at the beginning. 
it's important mm-hmm. about understanding what's what's agreed because only when you understand what's been agreed and it's clearly visible and procurement are allowed to have input on that and be aware of that that an assessment can be made at the end of it so you can't try and do that right at the end of a project and i think that's unfortunately the uncomfortable position that procurement get put in a lot of the time when it's just a question of we're thinking about engaging supplier x have they done a good job in the last 12 months and and you know procurement have got to then go around and our stakeholders who like you say have forgotten about it they've moved on it's not really documented they've got to try and think back so um that i i think that's going to change i think it's got to change um and i think that you know technology will play a big part in that because it has to because you just mm-hmm. got to make things efficient otherwise it's yep. just you know trying to do it manually it's just not going to happen um which is which is incredibly where a lot of organizations or most organizations like you said very few organizations have got services procurement under control in terms of understanding what they're getting for their money. So I think it's a huge area of opportunity. Um, so I think some exciting times ahead on that side of things. Um, but listen, it's been really, really interesting chatting to you. Um, covered some great points there. Um, I love some of your examples. And um, one last thing I just wanted to kind of uh, mention before we wrap things up is you've just started uh, a podcast yourself, I believe. I have, yeah. It's called MarPro, uh, Marketing Procurement Podcast. And um, I was actually approached by Rusty Pepper, who's my co-host in it. And he's got the Why Marketing Podcast. And he said, this is really, is there anybody in this space? Is there anybody doing anything? And I was like, "Mm, I blog, but (laughs) you know, that's about it. So yeah, it's interesting because it's a very small niche um, in the market. There are not a lot of people that obviously are the target audience. I think I try to expand it for all procurement people, but yeah, the podcast, um, it's been interesting being on the other side of the fence, so to speak, right? Being the one getting to ask the questions and do those things, but it's been fun. It's, I think you can learn a lot and grow a lot by pushing yourself to do things. Like I'm stepping out of my comfort zone to do more interviews and to do this podcast with somebody. And, um, yeah, it's, it's been very entertaining to try to get it together with a marketer <laughs> and all of the, uh, you know, times we've clashed over. I think it took us a month to come up with us both agreeing on the logo and agreeing on the name. I mean, that alone was a couple of months in the process. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been interesting. We've had some great people on there and I think there's a lot to learn. Um, from either marketing procurement, which is basically, to me, most of the time services procurement, right? Because you have advertising agencies, media, things of that sort. So I think a lot of the things that you do in advertising can be the same thing you do with consultants, professional services, because at the end of the day, you're buying people's time, right? At the end of the day, you can break down an hourly rate into salary, overhead, and profit. I mean, things are black and white when it comes to that and that's I think kind of what I love about it so um yeah Yeah, I I think it's really cool and I actually think the fact that it's really niche is great um because you can really go to some depth and like you say when it's you know a procurement professional and a marketing professional you're going to have totally different outlooks and it's going to make for really interesting conversations um so yeah I'll definitely be keeping an eye on that but you know best of luck with it all I think it's I think it's really great and uh, cool to see what you guys are doing yeah, um, we're trying to bridge the gap, you know, between the two <laughs> versus going to fisticuffs because marketing procurement have a very uh, tenuous past relationship. So, I, I yeah, I do remember seeing the uh, the bridge the gap, mind the gap uh, <laughs> yeah. image on the on some of the collateral. But listen, thank you so much for joining me. I've really enjoyed our conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time, particularly early in the morning. Um, yes. And um, yeah, just want to wish you all the best with everything. Um, you know, the podcast included. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can catch up again soon. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. And thanks for dealing with my, you know, little ones. (laughs) Even (laughs) though we tried to go super early so they wouldn't get up. And of course, one of them wakes up. It always, it never fails, right? No problem at all. Mine arrived uh, back from school partway through uh, our podcast, but luckily uh, my my headphones managed to cancel them out, hopefully. But um, (laughs) it's always a risk. But you know what? It's just the way it is these days, isn't it? It is. People have gotten used to it, I think, unfortunately. I'm, I've am i still not gotten used to it because for me, it's like, oh, no, my kid's coming in the background. Um, but a lot of times people, I think, have been more acceptable to it. Like, oh, you've got a kid. Let's see your kid. It humanizes business in a sense, right? 
when sometimes you know being in the office you're not gonna be like hey here's my three-year-old I think you just got to go with it. One of the one of the best ones for me was uh, uh, a video call where in the background there was a really loud snoring, and I'm pretty I'm almost positive it was dog snoring. That's awesome. But I didn't say anything. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Excellent. Oh, well, listen, thank you so much, Dana. Really appreciate your time. Great to chat to yes. you, and uh, yeah, hopefully catch up with you again soon. Great. Thanks, Johnny.